Okay, we're uh, here and this week we're discussing, we're going to finish our discussion of social learning theory and learning in general. Um, <coughs> I want to go back to slide 18 and I went over it but uh, I felt in my heart of hearts that I was rushing a little and I got a little confused about it. So let's, uh, let's go back um, uh, to the 18. I want to talk about competence. Effective models perceived by observers being competent. Okay, uh, come back to me now. Um, competence is, is, is interesting because it is really not an issue that crack I just made about I'm mixed up anyway, right? You have to be able to talk like that. One of the mistakes that can be made by service deliverers, um, whether they're teachers, educators, even doctors. You ever have a doctor, you say, what a pump is blankety blank. I'm not going back there again, right? Uh, competence, the, a sense of competence does not come from pretending you know what you don't know. Okay, and it's very tempting when you're in a position of delivering services where you're the teacher and you're supposed to be telling people something. You're supposed to be delay, relaying information. Or you're the therapist and you're supposed to be the one who's, you know, got all this stuff going, right? It is impossible to be a, te a therapist without having a client, you say patient, no, a client say something that touches you emotionally. Oh yeah, my father was that way. Oh yeah, I went through that. And then you lost to quote unquote objectivity, right? Kind of thing. And it happens, you have to admit it. I, I'll tell you a story that happened to me, okay? I grew up in western New York, <clears throat> in Rochester, New York. Oh, Rochester, my Rochester, a hymn of praise we sing to thee, whose sturdy fathers built so well beside the Genesee. That's the Genesee River. I told you to stop being nervous. I don't charge for concerts. They're free. Okay? I may be the last person in the world who knows the Rochester City song. In any case, as a matter of fact, I may be the only person in the world who knew that cities had songs, right? <laughs> so, in any case, I remember in fourth grade, that is 50 years ago, I got up, <clears throat> who here's from Rochester? We had somebody here from Rochester, right? And they were talking about how Nathaniel Rochester, that's how the town got its name after a guy named Rochester, Nathaniel Rochester, not the guy in Jack Benny. Okay, Nathaniel Rochester founded it, and it talked about, where are you from? Greece. Push it down. Greece, where are you from? Penfield. Penfield. Webster and Penfield, two towns around there, and I'm not sure about Greece, were founded before Rochester. Okay? They were founded before Rochester. So I got up, I'm 10 years old or something or something like that, we're studying about the, you know, the local area, and I said, well, if there were already those towns, why didn't Nathaniel Rochester found Rochester? The answer was, I don't know, when I see him, I'll ask him. Years later, I became a history major, I'll tell you why. Because the other towns were agricultural towns, right? They were places where farmers brought their produce, they'd be taken to market. Uh, I can't remember what Rochester were founded before or after the Erie Canal. But the, the Genesee River has falls on it, right? See, I got two people agreeing with me. And falls, you know, it's not Niagara Falls, but they're little falls in the middle of the river because the river is flowing, right? Little falls. And Nathaniel Rochester had this idea of he's going to make a manufacturer there. Instead of shipping the stuff someplace else for the wheat that was grown there, yes, there was a lot of wheat grown in Western New York, and stuff. he's going to take it and he'll make a, a, a mill using water power. A water, well, you know how that works? You have a mill and it grinds the stones. And actually, it was a tremendous success. Rochester's nickname it's, it was called the Flower City, F-L-O-U-R. Later, of course, it stopped all the flower, moved to the Midwest, and so it became the Flower City, F-L-O-W-E-R, all kinds of parks and stuff. It has the biggest display of lilacs in the world. I know everybody in the world except people from Rochester say, say lilac. But since we have the biggest, had the biggest display in the world, in Highland Park, we're going to say lilac. If you don't like it, get out of our park. Okay? So it became the flower. But it was a tremendous success. And the idea was to establish it on a spot that was good for this a manufacturing place, 
because the Genesee River was not navigable because of these falls, in that time anyway, <coughs> rather than a little farther out near where the farms were. But she didn't know, so she tried to, she put me down, or she tried to bluff it or something. Don't do that. If you say you don't know, I'll look it up, or I'll take a look, or let me think about it, it gives you more of a sense of competence. People say, aha, this person is human, and, and if you're seen as an authority, then you can ring. If somebody hits an idea, you notice every once in a while somebody comes up with an idea I hadn't thought about. I tend to say, let me think it over. I like that idea. Or do that. It doesn't matter if you don't know everything. If you don't get the answers you want, etc. Okay? <clears throat> also, let's go back here. I want to also make some comments about gender-appropriate behavior. Okay? Come back to me. Uh, this has been a hot issue for 30 years, gender-appropriate behavior. The, the question of gender-appropriate behavior is an issue on the surface of age, right? Uh, infants don't know what gender-appropriate behavior is other than to scream and cry. They all do the same thing, right? You'll notice how extraordinarily important gender-appropriate behavior is to middle school kids. Just think back to some of the stuff that drove you out of your, that was so, such concern to you. Do you have the right? When we get to developmental theory, you'll see that, okay? Let me tell you right now. Um, developmental, Skinner and Bandura will tell you all you need to do is have people learn that all behaviors are appropriate for all genders. Don't make any gender differentials, and you'll be fine. Developmental theorists, everywhere from Freud to Koberg, to, are going to tell you, look, you're ridiculous. You really think you can get adolescents to say, oh, boys and girls doesn't matter, male, female doesn't matter. We're all the same. But you have to watch out what, what that means, and you have to watch for differences there. You have to be careful not to let your own prejudices, one way or the other, influence you. Okay? For a long time, you know who Babe, Babe Diedrichson was, right? Babe Diedrichson's a Harris from Texas, right? The great woman athlete. Her team won. It was either the regional, she was from Beaumont, right? The regional... Or the, or the state, her, her, the girls' team, as opposed to the boys' team, won the state championship. And she was the only person on the team, right? So they lost all the relay events and stuff, but she won the high jump, and she won all the sprints, and she won the long distance. She was a great athlete, right? But it, girls, sports weren't for girls, right? And we see that today. Okay, now it's okay for a girl to play sports, but can you imagine a man saying, I'm a football widow to my wife sitting on the couch. She's watching sports all day, and I want to go out and do something, right? We still have those stereotypes of the man sitting there with a beer. And, right? That's the old joke. I should tell when we get to front about a, I had a Freudian slip. I said, the other day, I, one more second, I had a Freudian slip with my husband the other day. So what happened? He said, well, he was sitting on the couch watching the football game, drinking a beer, and I was trying to clean up the house and he was in my way, so instead of saying, lift your feet, I said, you fat beer belly slob, you've been ruining my life, right? <laughs> so, it's a Freudian slip. So we still have that kind of a, that kind of a, so be careful on the one hand not to fall for the stereotypes when they're not appropriate, and on the other hand, be careful to be tolerant of kids' own stereotypes of what's gender appropriate. If a 14-year-old girl thinks this is what girls do because you're girls and you're not a boy, or a 14-year-old boy thinks this is what boys do because you're a boy and not a girl, <coughs> and you're going to try to be the model and you're the opposite gender, you got to be sensitive to that. On the other hand, don't go in assuming that that's true. right? And there are very subtle differences in this across ages, across subcultures. One of the trouble with multiculturalism is that it's, it blobs together all kinds of cultures that are very different from one another, right? And the lines are pretty arbitrary. 
there's a lot of ways in which Italian America, Italian culture is like Hispanic culture, much more so than it's like Swedish culture. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be careful and look for those things and be careful about things, right? What's going on here and how are things happening? How are they handled? So just be careful about that. Okay? Let's go back here once more. Identification with the model. I know. I know I come back to me. I know I got on my soapbox about my son and girl strawberry. But let me uh, once again plead with you, okay? You may find out that you're a five foot two female, right, who never had any interest in sports and never will, and find out that in some unique way you're the right model across gender for the six foot six, 280 pound right, lineman on the football team. I mean, let's say it's high school, 230 pounds, okay? So you have to be, be for, about something that, that you never know, right? For my son, remember I talked last week, just that tall and skinny, that's what did it. In this case, it could be, I don't know, some crack you make about your family, right? You know, I come from a large family, oh, so does he. Oh, I'm an only child, oh, so is he. And there's an identification there, a certain strong identification about, about things, right? So you have to be careful about that. Or, I, you know, my grandparents died before I, you're in the fourth grade, and my grandparents died. You might say, you know, I never knew my grandparents might say, and here's the one kid in the grade who can't talk about, what's today? About his grandparents because they all died before he was born. I didn't know, right? So <laughs> you have to be very careful about identification and look for that kind of thing. So, you know, I laugh at be a role model, be a role model, be a role model. You may not be the right role model. It may not be appropriate. You may not be the relevant person, but you may be in ways that you never know. And whatever you do, I've said this 14 times last time, I'm going to say it again, do not assume stereo, don't fall into the stereotypic stuff about role modeling. Okay? Please, please, please don't do that. Okay? How about role modeling? Don't do it. Okay? Did I tell you about me and Jackie Robinson? No? Jackie Robinson was my hero when I was a kid. He was my hero for a long time. He was my hero when I grew up. One of them. I used to look for the way Jackie Robinson lived his life. Okay? It wasn't an accident that Jackie Robinson was the player who was used... You know who Jackie Robinson is, do you? All right, he knew. Here's a person seen, not even, born and raised in another country, and he knows. It's not a, an accident that he was the one who was chosen to break the, what they called in the color barrier, right? To be the first black player in the... Aside from the fact that he was a phenomenal athlete, he was a, he was a all-American in football. I even believe he was a champion swimmer. I mean, he was a phenomenal... But he was... So they had to be sure he would be good, right? That he would be good enough to make it. But he also, also was a fine human being, right? He was teased and ragged mercilessly, he, sometimes even by players on his own team, right? Eddie Stanky became famous because Eddie Stanky was from the South and went and put his arm around his shoulder and said, welcome to the team, because nobody was sure anybody would even talk to him. And there's some people who wouldn't. <coughs> he handled it, and, and Branch Rickey, who did this, talked to him a long time. There were, I mean, obviously, the, you had the whole Negro Leagues. There were a lot of outstanding black baseball players. But he was picked, <coughs> you know, for, for that reason. He, he had a certain calm and poise about him. He had a son who got into a lot of trouble. He handled it well. He was, after, you know, and he handled it with poise and dignity. And I saw him so, I don't know why, but this guy appealed to me in ways, and, you know, and I don't know how we were alike, so you have to be very careful. You might see a kid who's, Modeling, and you don't know, like, avoid stereotyping. Please. I will say that every single theory we come to, I will say that again and again. And I'm telling you right now, if, if simply I'm saying, hmm, I wonder if he's taking pot shots at multiculturalism, I am. Multiculturalism too often falls, down into, falls into stereotyping kids by their last name or what they look like or the parents were. Don't do it. There are plenty of black kids who hate basketball and don't want to play it. There are plenty of Asian kids who are not very good in math. Okay? There are plenty of black kids who just want to sit around and do math equations and have no interest in sports. 
and there are plenty of white kids who all they want to do is go out and play basketball. Just be careful of all this stuff, of stereotyping people, some people are good or bad by something. OK, let's go back to the PowerPoint. The next thing we need to talk about in modeling is vicarious learning. OK? So it's not only observing when modeling, but watching the consequences of reinforcement and punishment to other people. Let's stay on this. Okay. The learner watches the consequences, and this influences his or her behavior, or I should have said, or lack of behavior in the future. A person can decide to act or not to act based upon observing others. A person's belief in her or his ability can be influenced by watching others succeed and fail. Let me give you an example here. Okay, come back to me. I'm standing up. Ready? Here I go. Up I get. Okay. How many? I need a book. Give me a book. There's one. There's a, this will do. Yeah. How many people's favorite color is blue? Whose favorite color is blue? Is here? We did this. What? Okay. I want to do it again. When I come and smash her over the head and tell her my favorite color is blue, and I change other people's answers. That's vicarious learning, okay? That's vicarious learning. You change your behavior going from some of the other ones. What's your favorite color? Mm. Oh, green. That's a good color. Here's five hundred dollars. What's your favorite color? Say something else. Pink. What's your favorite color? Silver. It's green. Green. Here's a hundred dollars. Okay. Oh, sorry, five hundred. He, he's griping. <laughs> How many people color favorite color is green? Raise your hand. No kidding. For $500, your favorite color isn't green? What about $5,000? Whose favorite color would be green? See, the size of the reinforcement makes a difference. Right? So, I didn't hear, what did she say? It'd be green for $5, right? What do you care? It's five bucks you don't have, thanks. So, what's happening here, but this is extraordinarily important because what Bandura is telling Skinner is look, you're right that people's behavior changes by direct enforcement and reinforcement, reinforcement and punishment, but that's not the key issue. That happens that much more often people are observing consequences in social settings. And as that happens, remember, let me see if I can find it. Okay, remember here. Come back, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Remember, there's reciprocal determinism. As you watch the environment influencing other people's behaviors, your, oops, sorry, your attitudes change. Your attitudes change. You become aware, your opinions change, your behavior change here by watching what happens to other people. Okay, come back to me. So, so what happens here is that vicarious learning, you're watching and learning from what happens to other people. And therefore, the role in any kind of social setting, when you're working with one person, your job is no longer to say, OK, I'm going to reinforce this person, then that one, then that one, then that one. But you understand that whatever interaction I have with that person influences everyone else. Yep, you understand what I'm saying here? And that watching the consequences of what happens to other people, and this influences both behaviors and non-behaviors. Did I insult people here by asking for opinions about, yeah, let's try this. Let's try this. Okay, you're all sitting there doing nothing. Okay? See, okay. I want somebody to give me, how many people, if I were to ask you, how many people have an opinion about an, effect, an effective teaching technique or an effective therapeutic technique, how many people could, could list one? Raise your hand. Some, anything that would work. Come on, who knows something? Okay, good. Okay. Uh, George. George, push it down. Tell me one. Um, the question was the therapeutic. Give me, give me a, a technique that you think is effective teaching technique. To teach something. Um, 
Like multiple choice? Is that okay. What? Giving multiple choice exams. You know, George, I never realized what a stupid fool you were. Okay, ready for the next one? Who wants to tell me another one? Raise your hand if you got another one. Took one time! <laughs> Took one time! And all of a sudden, all the hands are down. Now what happened is you learned not to behave. There's a lot. You know, first of all, you learn that I'm a stupid jerk. Right? And that I'm obnoxious, that I'm rude. Probably that I don't know anything, because people give multiple choice tests all the time. It's a perfectly lovely teaching technique, right? By the way, I have a therapist for you outside, George, so don't worry about it, right? <laughs> But you see, so what happened, you learned, okay, I should have warned you beforehand, I was going to do that. But, so, one he, he and I, we get along okay, at least up till now, okay? So what happened is that it took one time for me, for you to learn not to act. When I said, who has it, I had about, I had about 15 hands up. After I insulted him, you learned not to act. So you're just sitting there, nothing is changing. I said, anybody else got an opinion, you're just sitting there, no hands are going up. So learning can, is not only behaving, but it's also learning not to behave. Changing your opinions about people, right? Because these things, went right? And of course, in that one thing I did, you learn not to behave, you change your complete opinion of me, right? It also changes, how many people, how many people, even though I told you, even though it's obvious that it's just a joke, that I was just trying to make a point, still are annoyed by what I did, have a knot in your stomach over what I did. Uh, yeah, it was a terrible thing to do, okay? So it's changed people's opinions, and it changed behavior. So you can learn not to behave in a certain way. <laughs> Say it again? Intimidation process? Well, what happened is by seeing what happened to him, right? I don't know if it's intimidating, because George could have come back and said, how can you be teaching a class? You're the idiot, not me. So I don't know. That's what you were thinking, weren't you? <laughs> He's not talking, right? Oh, it wasn't really right. Okay, he said no. So these are the kinds of things, so you can learn not to act. I should have warned you beforehand. I got a knot in my stomach now, too. Okay? It's okay, though. <laughs> he said, I'll get you later. No, he said, it's okay. Okay? So you see... Even without any behavior, you can learn not to behave. Opinions can change. How many people like George a little better after I did that to him, right? A few people, right? There we go, right? The opinions of him changed. Opinion, you liked him less, right? You liked him less. I see there's always brown noses. <laughs> opinions of me changed probably dramatically, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Have to be careful. Okay, and that would happen. I mean, if I ever saw a person do that for real, I would say, Whoa. I don't want to have anything to do with that person. Okay, there's another thing that can happen by watching other people. George, tell me what subject you were best at in school. English. English. Okay. So I'm sitting in school, and I'm in George's class. And the teacher gives us a problem. At, were you good in grammar? Um, yeah, push it down, push it down, push it down. I was pretty much good in it all. Good at all. So he's, he's, he's going for grammar, right? How many people here, when you hear him say that, say, maybe you were right about George. Who hated grammar, right? A lot of people, right? a lot of people. All of those people, right, we're going to have a grammar problem up there. And the teacher is putting it up there and saying, okay, George, you demonstrate how this works. George is looking, George is this. He doesn't get it. How many people knowing how good he is in grammar would say, well, if he can't do it, I can't do it. Look at all those hands up. You see, you didn't even try. But by watching the best English student in the class, or in the class, not be able to do it, observing him, it influences your belief about your own abilities to do it. Or the other way around. Who was lousy in math? Okay, I'll go myself, okay? Here I am. Believe me, if you had been in math class with me, you wouldn't have had too good an opinion about my math abilities, okay? 
So we're going to say, okay, she says, okay, Lieberman, you give it a shot. I give it a shot and I do it. Take my word for it. I was lousy at it. How many people here, would, if you had seen the worst, one of the worst math students in the class, do it? In defense of myself, this was in the college track, right? There were people in that college. Okay. Would say, hmm, if he can do it, maybe I can do it. Even if you're not so good in math, right? You see, we get getting hands going up. So watching your opinion of other people, okay, about your abilities are influenced by watching other people, whether they can do it or not do it, okay? Everyone in here right, would assume that if Tiger Wood can't make a golf shot, I can't make it. Everyone would assume that, right? Or if someone says, well, you know, I won a golf tournament. That ever happened to anybody? I remember that happened to my mother. She's playing a guy in chess. My mother's a good chess player. <coughs> I guess she still is, but she won't play me, with me anymore. She bridges her thing. Okay? And we were oh, visiting, when I was a kid, we were visiting someone. He said, she, he, she saw chess. He wrote, and she said, yeah, you want to play? She said, sure. And she, <laughs> and, she, and she began to get, and he said, well, you know, you're pretty good. You know, I was the uh, Monroe County chess champion. It's a county Rochester. She, was in. she fell apart. Right? All of a sudden, and she was beating him, I'm telling you. All of a sudden, her opinion of her ability to succeed was diminished by the fact that she was playing somebody. She said, Well, if he's a champion, I can't beat him. Right? I mean, she was her high school champion, but the county champion, ooh, ooh, ooh. So you have to be careful about it. So that can happen a lot. Right? That can happen a lot. And. So you have to watch out about that, okay? Now, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Thus, cognitive processes are clearly implied, since we remember what we saw, decide how to act in future situations or how not to act, and we draw conclusions about our own abilities by watching others, okay? So let's take the two situations I put down. Come, come to me, right? Okay, when I... Okay, let's go back to this. I changed my mind. Let's go back to the power. You remember what I did to George. You decide how to act in the future in the same situation, which is not to raise your hand about anything for this, for this guy. And your, your opinion, okay, and you also draw conclusions about me, that I'm an idiot, right? That I'm rude and obnoxious. And also probably drew conclusions that I don't know what I'm talking about. Because what do you mean? Multiple choice tests are not a good educational thing too. How can that be? Okay? Likewise, in this other situation with George, you have to remember that he's good in that he's a very good English student. You watch him and see that he can't do it. That must be impossible. If George can't do it, how can any of us do it? And you decide what to do, which is not to try. Okay, now come back to me for a second. Come back, come back. How many people in here who were pretty good English students but not the best would say, I'm going to take it on? Because if I can't do it in George, if I can do it in George, I have nothing to lose by losing. George can't do it, what do they expect from me? But if I can do it and George can't, the teacher's going to have a much better opinion of me. Who would give it a shot? Even though you knew that there was, after watching George, there was a 98% chance that you would fail in front of everybody, because this is in public, you would fail in front of everybody. Who would still give it a shot? Anybody? Yeah, I still have a few people doing it. What the heck? How many of you who gave it a shot were good English students? All of you? You're not such a good English student? Good for you. Tell me your name. Marshall. Remind me, I don't ever want to get in a fight with you here. <laughs> That's one tough person, Marshall. Okay. Okay, so it, it can make some people, so that's the problem. You're never sure what people are going to decide, okay? I would have given it a shot. I wasn't the best English student in the class, but I was pretty good. I, I, I would give it a shot. In math, I, I wouldn't have. <laughs> Who was good in math? You were good, Marshall? Say, so if Marshall can't do it, forget it. I can't do it. <laughs> I give up. 
So it depends on, so you have to be careful. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So there are cognitive, cognitive processes involved in watching others succeed and fail being reinforced in, pun being reinforced in punishments. And behavior is not the same as learning since <coughs> based upon when a person's observed, the person decide not to engage in a behavior or not to try to learn in the future. And what we have done here is gone from a model saying that learning is based on behavior to saying of observing behavior to saying that learning is intimately involved with cognitive processes. Okay, come back to me for a second. And this is going to make a big, 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 big difference. Just about every, okay. Bandura is the first, is really one of the, he's not the only way, but he's the first person in the learning camp to say this. And what he's telling you is your job is not just, not just to get the right answer, to give the, the learner give the right answer, or the patient, the th client give the, show the right behavior in public, right? But if, here, I'll give, I'll give you a chance, okay? <clears throat> let me pick on someone else. Oh, let me pick on George, one therapy, right? I might as well only, I've already got him as a therapist, okay. Were you any good at math? Say no. No. Okay. George is in, he's in my fifth, sixth grade class, and he cannot do his multiplication tables. George, wave to your fans over there, to your therapist, there he is, okay. <laughs> So here's what I do. I come in and I say, George, how much is six times six? I say 39. 39. I say, class. Let's boo George. George the dummy, George the dope. I go after him like this. And I tell him, until you learn those tables, I'm going to humiliate and embarrass you and have the class gang up on you every time. And it worked. In a month, he knows them all. George, how much six times six? 36. All right, see, I did it. We're going to take a vote now. This is a vote. How many people think that was an effect, that, that I got all the behaviors, he knows them all? Okay. How many people think that that's a good teaching, teaching technique? How many people think it's an awful teaching technique? Unanimous. Obviously. By the way, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Push it down, push it down. It's not necessarily healthy or productive, but it's effective. Like it's you a, did well, well, push it down. You did teach well, let me ask you, should I do it? Not under this circumstance. No. Would you do that? You're in a sixth grade class. You're the teacher. Right. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So in the end, because why? Because it humiliates him. He learns he's awful in math. He learns that people don't like him. He learns that there are all kinds of attitudes that can be learned that may be more important. Now, we're going to get eventually the theories that are going to say that's all that counts. Okay? <coughs> so, here, I'm back. I'm going to sit down again. Okay? So, whoops. So, this theory, in summary, okay, Wait a minute, what's going on there? Oh, I know what happened. Okay, this theory in summary is a very cognitive one as well as a behavioral one. But in the end, it seems to imply that you have to take people's emotions, people's feelings about themselves in order to get the right behavior. You'll still see people who are working here working toward the same goal, toward the same model, toward the same knowledge. Okay. Ultimately, we're going to get theories that say, but people, you know, that's not shouldn't be. School. So let's go back to eight for the, to the PowerPoint for a little summary. That's slide eight. So what we have here is modeling, learning through observation. Modeling teaches new behaviors, and it's done without reinforcement. And we have vicarious experience, not only for behaviors. But people's belief in their ability is influenced by watching others succeed and fail. And this makes Bandura's theory much more efficient than Skinner's. Because I can teach a whole bunch of people by teaching one person. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Okay, you ready? Come up here, let me try something strange. Okay.
<clears throat> okay, watch. I have one student here who I have signed to read, okay, an article on alphabets, okay? Just one. So I'm going to ask him. Sam, when it comes to direction, I signed him. I really did. You'll see. You'll get the right answer. What's the difference between the Latin alphabet and the Hebrew alphabet when it comes to direction? Latin is left to right and Hebrew is right to left. Who didn't know that before? Did everybody know that? Okay. Okay. Who did not know that before? Okay. Marshall, right? No, That's me, Marshall. Tell me. Allison. Allison. I can't see. I never, I can't hear. I can't see. Allison, take the microphone. Okay. Allison, in what direction does the Hebrew alphabet go? Um, right to left. Right to left. <laughs> Who else didn't know that before? Name? Daryl. Push it down. Push it down. Push it down. Daryl. Daryl. What direction does the Hebrew alphabet go? Right to left. Okay. You see how efficient that was? By having teaching one person, everybody knows. Okay? You see what I'm saying? And and by the way, Brenda's gonna tell you to do that. Be sure it's somebody, you know, don't do it with a person who's got a reputation as a whiz bang in a language. And if 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 you can take a person who's, you know, say, Oh, if he can do it, I can do it. So by watching other people, or if I have him demonstrate how to, how to write a Hebrew letter, you can all watch it. It's not all I have to teach him and her, her and him and her and him and her and him, right? It's very efficient. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the PowerPoint. Bandura introduced the concept of self-efficacy. Just about every theory is going to have it, with the exception of information processing. One reason I don't like that theory too much. Okay? Children's feelings about their ability are a better predictor of success than their actual abilities. Let me read that sentence again, emphasizing children's feelings about their ability are a better predictor of success than are their actual abilities. Come back to me for a second. Self-efficacy, if you have a high self-efficacy about something, you feel I can do it, okay? So if somebody were to say to me, okay, we're going to give a test about the knowledge of Hebrew grammar in this room, I would have a very high self-efficacy about how I would do in the test. I'd come in first or second. Okay? Sam knows Hebrew too, that's why I picked on him, so... Uh, I don't know who knows better than I would, I would do well. Anybody else know Hebrew? First or second. Okay? Now, if we were to do something about a Spanish grammar test, I would have very low self-efficacy. I studied grammar or Spanish in high school. I remember about three things. So I would do better than people who never studied if those three things were asked on the test, but, right? <coughs> who knows another language other than Spanish, English, or Hebrew? What language do you know? Urdu. Push it down. Urdu. Urdu. Language of Northern India, right? Northern India? I would, Pakistan. Right, the northern part of the Indian subcontinent, I would have a zero self-advocacy. Maybe. Anybody know any Asian languages? What do you know? Vietnamese. Say it again. Vietnamese. Vietnamese. If you were to give me questions about Urdu grammar and Vietnamese grammar, I'd have a higher self-efficacy about Urdu than Vietnamese. I'm ready to bet, because Urdu was an, an, an Indo-European language, which English also is. I'd be ready to bet that if you said to me, okay, we're going to give you three lessons in each language, I, I'd say, I'll bet I can learn something about Urdu in three languages of Vietnamese. I, I just, I don't know anything about it. It would scare me, scare me to death, because I'm not good in languages. I'm not. That I know. How many people here are really good in language and figure, I don't care what it is. Give me three lessons, I'll, I'll learn something. Yeah, see, we have several people like that. Not me. How many people here have taken languages and it was painful to them? Painful. 
Imagine that. And I did my master's degree in another language. It was painful, painful. Okay, so all of that, but that's a function of my self-efficacy that I really don't think I'm very good in languages. Now listen to what Bandura said. In this room, I have gathered the following people. I have given tests, teacher opinions, several standardized tests, asked several teachers over several years, talked and interviewed to all the people in this room. And you and the people on, on this, let me do it this way, to all the people taking the course. Everyone taking this course now is at exactly the same ability level. Exactly the, and everybody in this room is at exactly the same ability level in math. And they all are at a higher ability level than the people taking it, taking this course by watching it on cable or TV, right? Or cable or, or, or on a disc, or a DVD. But these are all the people at this ability level who, have to, who I have determined after extensive testing think they stink in math. And all the people taking it on watching the course on TV or from a DVD or a tape, they're all in the lower ability level than the people in the, sitting here in front of me, but they all say, I'm pretty good in math. I think I can do it. Bandura will tell you that if we start a math lesson that's at the theoretical ability level of the people here and a little above the one of the people taking it on the tape, that in the end, of the eight weeks that we're doing this, the people taking it by tape will do better and have higher grades than the people in here. If person A thinks I'm good at this and person B thinks I'm bad at this and their ability level is the same, there's almost no doubt that person B will do better than person A. Almost no doubt. That's a shocking thing. That's why Teaching George the multiplication tables at the price of his saying, I'm horrible at math, is not worth it. If you teach somebody something and what happens, the person learns, yeah, I finally learned it, but I really stink at this stuff. It's, not, it, it, it's hard to do. People turn it off. I can't do it. In the end, I won't do it. We'll get that to Piaget. So you've got to be careful. There are people here there are people here who can do things okay and think they stink at it. It took me forever to realize that I was an average athlete. I used to think I was the worst, worst athlete because I was the youngest kid in my grade. You know, muscles. You know, they have these 10-year-olds, 8-year-olds doing push-ups in the Pee Wee League teams. Forget it. <laughs> None of that works until you hit puberty. Okay, that's all hooey. Okay? So I reached puberty late. I was the youngest kid in the class, and in seventh and eighth grade, I was a horrible athlete. I was convinced the whole time it was awful. Then I went overseas to study for a year, and there were kids there who went to school districts where the entry date was late, and they were younger than I was. And they were gone to school, and all of a sudden, I couldn't believe it. I was all right. It wasn't the best, but it wasn't the worst. I couldn't believe it. It took some real, and to this day, I still wonder with this. Now I can barely move, but in those days, I, it took a long time for me to overcome because I had learned that I was no good at things. <coughs> I remember in high school, we played tennis. I played tennis. That was the one thing I thought was good. And I beat another kid in tennis, and the coach wrote down that he won. Because just as soon as I was the worst, and we went back to the records. I said, Coach, I won. He said, no, no, no. Finally, the other guy came up and said, yeah, you beat me. You now we play a set or somewhere, five games, but because it was just an assumption. I was horrible. I would give up. I couldn't do it. So you have to be very careful about that. Very careful about the self-efficacy thing. Okay? <clears throat> now we're going to go into problems with problems. Here, let's, just one quick thing. Problems, problems. Okay, come back to me. <clears throat> okay, you have to remember that this theory is an extension of Skinner's theory. It is an attempt, as I said before, to try to solve the problems in Skinner's theory. One problem with Skinner's theory is making an in, is to try to be more efficient. If I teach one kid, I can teach everyone, right? 
I can demonstrate it to all. I don't have to reinforce each person individually. And problem number two is that it's obvious we learn from our environment. It's just obvious. We get attitudes from our environment. We look at things from our environment. Who did I call up here to make the golf swing? Right? Person who never played golf before. Who made the golf swing, right? Did you make the golf swing? Yeah. It's obvious. And it's obvious that much of what we learn is in a social context, and for Badur, particularly from the media, we talked about the Bobo dolls, from the media, that we're, we, even if you're sitting alone, you're in a social context most of the time, often. You're watching TV, you're watching the movies, you're watching this, you're watching that. Okay? You're listening to the radio. How many people here, if the radio breaks, this is bad for your car if the engine blows up because you can't drive without the radio on? Who's that way? Look at this, half the class. Me too. How many of the people who can drive without the radio on are talking on your cell phone when you're driving? Oh yeah, I got a few people here, okay. How many people just can drive along, no more? Yeah, it's interesting, a few people, right? Of course, if you're not paying attention to your social context, context you wind up smashing into somebody, right? So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're always interacting with it, and so it's very efficient. That it, it, it's clear that we're always learning from our environment, but there are problems. In the end, you'll notice that although he talks about non-reinforced, he talks, Bendur talks about non-reinforced behaviors about modeling. He's still heavily invested in the idea of reinforcement and punishment, but it comes from in not only personal, but what you see in your environment. And even though he talks about reinforcement and punishments in the environment, changing not just behaviors, but attitudes, he's still heavily invested in that idea. And let's go back to the PowerPoint. That makes the problem of the circularity of the term reinforcement is even worse for Bandura than it is for Skinner. Okay, come back to me. I'll show you why. How many people here really like the taste of coconuts? Oh, Mounds bars, yummy, yummy in my tummy. Mounds, they're my favorite candy, flavor it candy. Wonderful chocolate Peter Paul Mounds. There's not a commercial I don't remember. Okay? Good thing I was out of the country for a few years, my wife said, because then you'd be singing 60 more commercials. Okay? And how many people hate the taste of coconuts? Yeah, usually it's 50 50, we've got 60 40. Okay, so here I go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to vicariously reinforce people. Who likes the taste of coconuts again? Yeah, you like the taste of coconut? No, you hate it? What about you? Um, you like it? I do not like it. Eat, right? Don't yeah. like okay, don't like it. Who likes it? Okay, here we go. So here I am. I'm going to start with this. You hate it? Okay. I'm going to start over here. And I'm going to ask the person. Tell me your name again. Allison. Allison. Okay, Allison. Fourth grade. Fifth grade, whatever it is. Tell me some multiplication. When you get some all right, get some all right. You like coconuts, right? No. Now, who likes them? <laughs> Name? Gia. Gia. Okay. Woo! She got them all right. Good. Here, Gia. Oh, here's I have my little bag of mini Mounds bars, right? Ooh. Can't see me over here, huh? Here, Gia. Take this. Open it up. I got a little bit. Even oh, yummy, yummy, yummy. Have it. Who else likes taste of coconuts? Works. Name? Maddie. Maddie. Maddie, give me some multiplication tables. Oh, she gets them all. Oh, you got them all right. Here's them all. Oh, eat it. I'll show everybody to see. Daryl. 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 Say it. Daryl. Okay. Daryl gets some. Woo! Now we get over to Allison. Remember, Allison, if you get it right, I'm going to take out the mounds bar and make you eat it. You're going to get the multiplication tables right? Make a mistake, I don't give you one. No. No. <laughs> how many people here would give how many people here would give every wrong answer just to be sure you wouldn't have to eat a mounds bar? 
One, two, three, four, five, right? Hate coconuts. So what I think is a reinforcement, it's a reinforcement for Gia and Daryl and who else got to eat coconuts? And Maddie, and it was, is a punishment for a whole bunch of other people. Get what I'm saying? There's a time about my son in the timeout room. I told you about that, right? Didn't I tell you about that? Yeah, the one, oh, I wish we had a timeout room in my school. Didn't I tell you about that? My son hears about if you're bad, there's a timeout. You get sit to the timeout room in a public school. From his, I told you he had his friend Stephen. He talking about his friend Stephen in the public schools, right? Stephen told him about that. He comes to me and said, boy, he went to a private school. He said, oh, boy, I wish we had one of those in our school. He said, I'd be bad all the time. I said, I said, well, I said whenever I got nervous, you just go there, you sit. It's quiet. Nobody bothers you. He was 10 years old. We're driving on the street, it's at night. I remember we're coming back from some place. It must have been nine o'clock at night, we're driving back. And we stop at a light and there's one of those self-service gas service gas stations. Then you go and you pay the, the person in the booth and there was a man sitting there. He said, oh man, when I grow up, that's the job I want. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> he said, you just sit, you're quiet. You watch TV, they got a little TV in there, he saw it. Nobody bothers you. Once in a while you have to do something. You can read a book if you want. Perfect. For him, if you were told every time he acts up, he'd be in a time out room, he would be acting up, but when time come back, act up again, right? By the way, today he's a stand-up comic, so what can I tell you? I don't know. But it's, but it's, you know, so it's... So what was punishment for most kids to him would have been the world's best reward. He was so mad at Stephen that he had this time out room. She was I don't want to go there. I said, why? I remember they had an argument about it. So you never know. You ne because reinforcement doesn't mean anything, because what will make one person behave one way, if another person not right, et cetera, et cetera, what's reinforcing for one person, ooh, Mounds Bars. I'll tell you my favorite food, yum yum cookies. Yum yum cookies have coconuts in them. Coconut and chocolate. This is what the gods ate on Mount Olympus. Coconut, I love them. One time somebody had some yum yum cookies, there was a half a box left, and said to me, oh, why don't you go and put them in the office for other people? But when I got to the office, they were all gone. You know, I'm just walking down the hall, all gone. I love them. Other people, obviously, if you don't like coconuts, you would hate them. Believe me, they're, oh, they're wonderful. <coughs> so that becomes the problem. Okay, let's ask another one. How many people here admitted hated recess? You like to recess the people who grew up in West New York in the spring? Oh, you go outside and all the snow's melting. You have to understand, in Rotser it snows all the time. It snows and melts and snows and melts. It snows in April and melts. And there's that, it snows all the time. All right? You see all, all the snow on the ground in Minneapolis is there forever. That's because it snowed six years at the beginning of the winter and never melts because it's 72 below zero. Once the earth snows and it melts into my luck. You get in the muck in the mud. I, I just didn't like it. Yeah, I know. I couldn't tell the guys. When I was a kid, I just didn't like it sliding. There was nobody who didn't like recess. The teacher would say, okay. If you're quiet for 10 minutes, it was too noisy, well, I'll have five minutes extra recess. It's all I could do from starting to go, <laughs> right? If, the other, if I didn't know the other kids would, would get on me, right, would probably bang me into a pile of mush. That was the other side of it. I would have done it all the time. I just didn't like it. How many people remember being in school where there's a reward for doing something, the reward to you was <laughs> Dr. Gooden was on our faculty. I remember years ago, a kid was in, you know, he wouldn't, he was in kindergarten, and he wouldn't do the work, he wouldn't do the stuff. He said, why? Every time I get you to do it, she puts a, when you finally do it, she puts a smiley face on He says, smiley faces are stupid. You know, she made the face that he made. He didn't care about them. So you're putting on smiley faces to him, it's just you're messing up his paper with these stupid stickers. You never know. And so what's happening now, why is it a worse problem? For Bendura, yeah, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. 
Okay, you can never know how the observer reacting which he or she sees what's reinforcement for one person may be punishment for another. Okay? Okay. So, come back to me. The, okay, the problem is that if I have... You like coconuts or you don't? Who doesn't? Okay, that's right. Go ahead and tell me your name. She's from Rochester, too. Lisa. I'm from Rochester, not like coconuts. Go ahead. Lisa. Lisa. If I'm Skinner, and Lisa does something I want, and I give her a mouse burn, she goes, get that thing out of the way from me. I know, I know that coconut candy is not good for her. Lisa, you like spinach? Actually, I do. <laughs> All right. Now I try spinach. Oh, good, helping the spinach. Right, she hasn't eaten in six hours. I gotta be sure that. I know that spinach at least is a potential reinforcement. I know it by, by trial and error. I can find out, even though it's, you know, it's just trial and error. But with Bendura, I can't tell. Oh, so watch. Hey, class, look what Lisa did. Here's some spinach, and Lisa's doing it more and more. <laughs> Let me tell you, my friends. How many people can't to have stand to have spinach near them? Okay. How many people here actually have a food, this is about individual, that makes you physically ill to be near it? I mean, it's not just you don't like it, it's a physical illness. And people say, oh my God. What's yours? Hummus. Oh, you don't like hummus? Who loves hummus? Oh, man. I went to Israel the first time I ate it, they couldn't get me out of the restaurant. I ordered about 42 dishes of it. I mean, if, if I put it under your nose, you go like this? Sickening, huh? Who else has one like that? What do you have? Push it down, push it down. Beets. Beets. I don't like beets, but it makes you ill to be near them, right? If you prepare them just right, if you make a nice Russian borscht, beet borscht, that's good. With a hot potato in it, that I can eat. Yeah, no, <laughs> you want to smother it in gravy. <laughs> Who else has a food like that? What's yours? Sushi. Sushi. Can you imagine that? How many people love sushi? Yeah, look at everybody's had this out. Who has another one that most people like? What's yours? Anchovies. Anchovies. What's yours? You like it? Jello. Jello, isn't that amazing? <laughs> It's not, most people would say, well, I'd rather have ice cream. But jello, you know what mine is? You're going to be toasted marshmallows. They make me so sick. When my wife and I got married, we had you know, four kids, two and two kids, so, and <coughs> they were all living with us, so, and we had a fireplace, oh, and we kind of, oh, and we, we moved into the window, oh, build a fire. So my kids say to her kids, watch, we'll show you something with dad, watch. They went and they took toasted marshmallows, and they roast them in the fireplace, and then they stuck behind me, and they went and they took the stick and put it under my nose, and went, Ooh, you know, just like that I went. It's horrifying to me. So you never know. I remember when I was a kid at camp, I thought everybody else was crazy. Oh, we're going to go and have a marshmallow roast. I said, what are you, nuts? I mean, just a, if they're, if they're regular marshmallows, they're fine. The minute they says, I mean, it makes me ill. I knew one guy, he could walk in a house. If they had steak there two hours before, he had to walk, turn around and walk out. So you never know. People are different. But at least with Skinner, you can figure it out. I mean, it, it was, it's an obvious thing to try with little kids as a toasted marshmallow, right? He would try it with me and say, you know, I'm telling you, there's almost nothing, nothing that you could, if you, if I saw that we're going to, that the, that the, purpose of doing something, and the reward is going to a campfire, and we're going to have a cookout, and I know there are going to be marshmallows there, I won't do it. I, I just can't stand to be near them. When I was a counselor in camp, the other counselors would know. The minute the marshmallows came out, I would walk into the woods 10 feet. I couldn't stand them. Skinner knows, but Bendora doesn't, okay? There's another problem. We'll start in it before the break. Let's go to it. When naturally occurring behaviors are reinforced, they tend to be extinguished if reinforcement is drawn, is withdrawn. That is, they stop being natural. 
Okay, come back to me for a second. I'll give you an example. This story is told in every culture, just about every culture. I'll tell it from an American perspective, right? There's a guy, he's working the graveyard shift, okay? He gets home. You know what the graveyard shift is? Working all night. You all know graveyard shift, right? So he goes to work at, goes to work at, at, at 10 at night and gets home at, uh, uh, he goes to work at midnight and gets home at 8 o'clock in the morning, okay? Then he sits down, he makes himself a breakfast, he does this, and then goes to sleep, and he gets to sleep about 10 o'clock. 2.30, the kids come from the school, he's had four hours of sleep, he's trying to get sleep, they're screaming and yelling outside as well, they're screaming and yelling and yelling and screaming. And, hey, kids, shut up, get away from here, I'm trying to sleep. Doesn't do any good. Finally gets a brilliant idea. Calls the kids over and says, listen, you guys. He said, I really like, I want you to scream and yell outside my window as much as you can. Every time you do it, I'm going to give you a buck. When you come home from school, be sure you're standing right outside my window. Play in the street right outside, in a, right outside my house and scream and yell. They come every day, gives them a buck for a week. Right? Five days of school. It comes the next Monday, they come over, scream, they come over, gives them each half a buck. You say, you promised that was going to say, well, I didn't get overtime this week, and I kind of, it's all I can afford. All right, this goes on for four days. The Friday comes, he gives him a quarter. He said, what happened? A quarter? You're sorry, a buck, I'm having one. He said, well, I just found out at work next week, uh, they're going to cut me back on my hours, and I had some expenses on my car, so I couldn't afford it. You know, it's coming on Wednesday. Next Wednesday comes, he gives them all a nickel. So what happened? Only a nickel. He said, well, I have to buy a new car, I can't even fix that's all I can afford from now on. So for a nickel, it's not worth it. They won't yell and scream under his window anymore. Right? We all know that story. You saw what was coming. So when a behavior that occurred naturally, like screaming and yelling, when you begin to reinforce it, if you stop reinforcing, it stops happening. And this, my friends, is an enormous problem, especially in an educational situation. An enormous problem. Now, what would Skinner say about reinforcing a naturally occurring behavior? What would Skinner say about that? No, no. In other words, yeah, sure there are. Naturally. Let's say you have a kid doing something that you want the kid to do all the time. What would Skinner say about, oh, here's the kid. The kid is going, and uh, uh, he's sitting in, in, he's in preschool care, and he's sitting and he's reading in the corner. Right? Mother or father drops him off an hour early before school. You know, they have a program in the school. And the teacher says, well, do what you want as long as it's productive. He goes and sits and reads in the corner. What was Skinner say? Well, you're going to reinforce his reading behavior. Was Skinner say it's a good idea? Or? Why? Why, why, wouldn't Skinner, why would Skinner say, what are you doing? Why are we reinforcing their behavior? What do you, what do you, why should you reinforce it? It's a waste of time. Why don't you take a behavior that you want the kid to do that he's not doing? There's no point in reinforcing behaviors you already have. If I have a kid who consistently sits down and just does, does his work, <laughs> leave me alone. Right? If the same kid, when the kid gets in the playground, the kid's in the corner, gets in the corner, so work on that behavior. That the kid's off in the corner and won't play with the other kids. Try to get the kid out, you know, a series of, you know, successive approximations to do that. Modify that behavior. Don't worry about this. Right? Why would Ben Dora say, it would be a good idea to reinforce that little boy sitting in the corner reading books. Oh, look! Billy's reading a book! Here, Billy, here's a new car! Or here, Billy, here's a dollar! Or here, Billy, here's two stickers! Why would Bendura say it's a good idea to reinforce Billy for reading? Come on, come on, go ahead, Daryl. So that the other kids will see him reading and see that's a good idea? Exactly! Vicarious learning. You're vicariously reinforcing the other kids. Let's go to the PowerPoint. 
Daryl did not write this for me. I did it myself. Okay? But it also may be good because it might vicariously reinforce other people. Right? Matter of fact, Bandura would say, it's a good idea. Come back to me now. He'd say, hey, look, if you've got one kid who's getting the behavior that you want, try to get the other kids to see, reinforce that all the time, the other kids can see it. The problem is, if Billy, is that his name, Billy? If you stop giving Billy a dollar every time, he's going to stop reading. He's going to stop making noise out the window. And I got to tell you, it makes a difference. You know all these bookathons? Raise money for charity. How many books you read, you get a buck, right? Or for the class trip. For every book I read, you'll give me a dollar. You know what that? You know what it is? And then the kid comes and comes to read 275 books. You got to write a check for 275. You know what I'm talking about, right? The problem is, what happens the next time you say to the kid, "Okay, read a book." Well, what's in it for me? My son, the oldest one. I once said to him, "Why don't you ever read a book?" He said, "I never said what for." He said, I read everything they make me read. Why should I do anything else? Right? <laughs> so in other words, for him, reading was something you got to pay off for. You got to take a test, you read. You got to know something you read. But reading just for the pleasure of reading? Well, for. It's nothing in it for me. Fortunately, he got over it. But he writes comedy now. But you understand the point. Well, maybe there's something in it for him, right? So you have to be careful about that. And it's so tempting to do that. It is so tempting to do that. Because that lets you off the hook. Everybody, you have kids who won't read. So, well, I'll just take the kid who can read. I'll just take Daryl, right? He can read. Fine, Daryl. Oh, here, Daryl. Here's a sticker. Here's a star. Here's a this. Here's a that. Bandura would, Skinner would say, forget it. You've got to go to the kid who can't read and try to get him to read or her to read. So this is a problem. And it's a problem. It's a trap we all fall into. Okay, after we come back, we're going to go into the, some of the assumptions behind Bandura's theory, and then we're going to look at some other social learning theories that are very important for educating in the broad sense of it. Okay, see you after the break.